Jesus said to them, do you believe now? The time is coming. Yes, it is already here when you will be going your own way. Everyone will go to his own house and leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so you may have peace in me. In the world, you will have much trouble, but take hope, I have power over the world. When Jesus had said these things, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. Honor your son so your son may honor you. You have given him power over all men. He is to give life that lasts forever to all you have given to him. This is life that lasts forever. It is to know you, the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I honored you on earth. I did the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, honor me with the honor I had with you before the world was made. John 16, 31 to 17, 5, NLV. God is really real. What do many people today claim about God? That he's real. Yet, this doesn't mean that they enjoy a friendship with the living God. In truth, many people today don't really think that our God is real. Many people are rejecting having and living out a living faith. This is true for a number of reasons. What's at our faith's heart? The truth that through Jesus, we've come to know the one true God. To know God means more than just saying that a vague universal God is real. We also can assume that all faiths lead their followers to the Bible's God. What do we say that biblical faith involves? A friendship with the God who meets us in Jesus. Knowing this God in turn <coughs> leads us to see all of life in a special way. Our faith commitment makes us live in a special way. We live for the glory of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Our faith gives us the base for knowing how to live for God's glory. Theology helps in this, for it helps us in our quest to know the Bible's God. God and today's universe. But how can we keep teaching the old word, the old word about Jesus is God today? Does our saying that we're Christians mean anything in today's world? Can we hope that people will listen when we say that God has met us in Christ? In answering these questions, what must we do? Remember that our world's full of people with many different religious ideas. So our claim that the Christian faith is true may take different forms. Is there a God? Our answer to atheism. What do many people today say? There's no God. We may call their saying this atheism. A theism, a word that means no God. Atheists say that the universe wasn't made by a personal God. Rather, it was shaped by blind, random nature. Or they think because there's evil in the universe, a good God can't be real. What has come into the universe's collective character? a spirit of atheism. <coughs> Many people have thrown out the idea of God. They've been forced to do so by a scientific view of the universe. 
This leaves no room for religion. For these people, God has become a crippling restraint on human power. What is intellectual atheism? Something pretty new in human history. It only gained a wide following after the church grew into the Greek ruled world. It came about because many Greek thinkers didn't accept the Christian good news. Why should we look at how intellectual atheism grew? It gives us a window on our universe today. What did the Greek thinkers love to do? Argue. Above all, they argued about whether or not they could prove theological ideas. These ideas included the truth of the one God. In their arguments, they grasped God as being the universe's first cause. Moved by the Greeks, what did Christian thinkers come up with? Arguments that they thought proved that God's real. These Christian thinkers wanted to give a smart yes to faith in God. One such thinker was Anselm of Canterbury. Such thinkers thought that they were just living out an important saying of Augustine. The saying is, I don't seek to grasp that I may trust, but I trust in order to grasp. For Anselm, who lived from 1033 to 1109, rational proof that God's real gave Christian faith the needed grasp. Christians came up with three main types of arguments to show that God's real. What are they? Ontological proofs, cosmological and teleological proofs, and moral proofs. The first type of proof is the ontological approach. It claims to show that God's real by thinking about God's idea itself. What do ontological proofs start with? A commonly held definition of God. They then show that there must be a being, God, who matches the definition. These ideas claim that by definition, God can't just be an idea in our minds. He must be true and real. Who said that God is the greatest that we can think of? Anselm, in his old ontological proof. He then gave two things that could be true. One, God is real only in our minds. Or two, God is real both in our minds and outside of them. Anselm said that the answer must be number two. If it were to be number one, this God isn't the greatest that we can think of. We could think of a God that's real both in our minds and outside of them. This second God must be greater than the first. So Anselm said that by definition, God must be real both in our minds and outside of them. Centuries later, what did the French thinker René Descartes who lived from 1596 to 1650, what did he do? He said something in the same kind of way. God, he said, is the perfectly perfect being. Now, if God isn't real outside our mind, Descartes said, he isn't perfect. He isn't real outside of our minds. So, he said, to be perfect, God must be real outside our minds. In the 1800s, who gave a quite different ontological proof? George Hegel, who lived from 1770 to 1831. He said that God is the one without limits. God is the one who stands as different than us. The idea of such a God, Hegel said, is needed by our human thinking. The mind, he said, can't only think of reality with limits. 
it must at the same time think of a state of being without limits. We can't think only of dark. We think of dark as the state that there is when there's no light. In the recent past, what did Norman Malcolm, who lived from 1911 to 1990 say? God must be real because by that we can think of him. He can't not be real. Malcolm trusted that God's being real is by definition needed being real. That is to say, God must be real. God is real because we need him to be real. The second type, <clears throat> the second type of proof are the cosmological and teleological arguments. They seek to show that God's real by drawing on proof given by our sight. What do cosmological and teleological arguments build from? What we see of the universe. They say that God must be real as the reason behind certain parts of the universe. What do cosmological proofs try to show? That God must be real as the real cause of the universe itself. The universe must have come from somewhere, and this somewhere is God. In the 1200s, what did Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas, who lived from 1225 to 1274, make? a number of cosmological and teleological arguments, which are called the five ways. Among Thomas's five ways is an idea often thought of as the best of the cosmological proofs. Said Thomas, <clears throat> every possible thing that's real must have a cause that made it real. In Thomas's view, something's possible if it could either be or not be, if it doesn't itself give a full reason for it being real, and if it's being real isn't unquestionable. Thomas was saying that the universe is made up of possible things. Because the universe is possible, it must have a cause that's beyond only possibly being real. Its cause must be true and certain. Any such cause would have to be a needed being beyond time and space. We call this being God. So God exhaustively explains himself. His being is self-evident. He doesn't need a cause and he must be. We don't exhaustively explain ourselves. Our being is not self-evident. We need a cause, and we could be here or not. In contrast to cosmological arguments, what do teleological arguments look to? More specific details of the universe. They say that God must be real as the cause of some specific thing we see in nature. The thing thinkers most often cite is the scene design in the universe. The universe's design means that there must be a great designer. What is most well known? The teleological argument of William Paley, who lived from 1743 to 1805. Paley's proof said that the universe is like a watch. In his day, a watch was a set of springs and wheels. It wasn't the electronic <clears throat> it wasn't the electronic watch we wear today. Paley said that a watch means that there must be a watchmaker, and that nature's detailed design means that there must be a great watchmaker, and that we call this great watchmaker God. Early in the 1900s, what did F.R. Tennant, who lived from 1866 to 1957, give? A new form of the teleological argument. 
there were thinkers for whom Darwin's ideas were something in the way of faith. But Tennant saw the universe's evolution as a sign that God is real. He found a wider teleology within evolutionary nature. Many strands have worked together to make higher and higher levels of creatures, he said. Evolution hit its peak in the coming of the human being, the moral creature. This work, Tennant said, gives ground for trust that God must be real. God's the one who guided evolution. What has the cosmologist Robert Jastrow said? That the Big Bang Theory once again makes the idea of God good. God's the one who started the Big Bang, <clears throat> who started the Big Bang that started the universe. The third proof starts with the human adventure of being a moral creature. What did Immanuel Kant, who lived from 1724 to 1804, give? an old form of the moral argument. Each human, he said, lives out of a sense of duty they can't avoid. Kant did not mean that all humans share the same one moral code. Rather, he said that behind the different codes humans make is the same feeling. It's the feeling of being morally trained or held responsible by duty's sense. What did Kant say? That God must be <clears throat> that God must be real if this adventure of moral duty is to have meaning. In a moral universe, good works must be rewarded and sins must be punished. But for this to happen, there must be a great lawgiver. This God makes sure that in the end, moral justice will be done. What did Hastings Rashdal, who lived from 1858 to 1924, think of? A different form of the moral proof. He said that our moral beliefs and goals are real only in our minds. But he said, certain moral laws are absolute certain set. These can only be real in a mind fit for them. <clears throat> that is to say, in a perfect mind. So he said, God, who has the perfect mind, must be real. <coughs> who does the most well-known form of the moral argument come from? C.S. Lewis. In his book, mere Christianity. All human societies follow the same basic moral code, Lewis said. In all cultures, certain actions are praised, while certain other actions are always punished. Murder is always wrong. Said Lewis, this shows that behind the universe lies something that's knowing, something that has goals, something that likes one kind of action more than others. So this something is more like mind than like anything else we know. So Lewis said, the something at the universe's base is God. What did British theologian Alistair McGrath do in the first 10 years of the 2000s? Argue with atheist Richard Dawkins <clears throat> over whether or not God is real. McGrath says that God is real as seen in all these ideas, cosmological, teleological, and moral, yet he adds a few more. McGrath also argues that God's real from anthropological and aesthetic points of view. Anthropologically, McGrath says that there has long been voiced a built-in human need for God. From an aesthetic point of view, McGrath says that nature's beauty points beyond itself.
Let's say that um, you can make a probable judgment cognitively. In other words, I think the evidence points this way, but existentially, I feel I can commit myself to this. So I think there's a tension between the probabilistic side of things and being able to actually live a life as a response to that. Then you make a good point, which I think is that uh, this therefore raises the question of the extreme improbability of God. And certainly you've made that point well in your writings. I think one of the responses I would want to make, though, would be this. Um, perhaps God is extremely improbable. I mean, it is very difficult to actually um, arrive at a, an agreement on what this might be. But in the end, I think the ultimate question is going to be improbable or probable. The real question is, is there a God? And I think that that is one of the problems I find, that the, there is a limit to the, 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 there's a limit to the position to which probabilistic arguments can take us. In that, in one sense, statistically, you and I are very improbable, and yet we're both here having this very interesting conversation. And so in one sense, there's this very difficult judgment about, given the fact that it may be improbable, does that actually mean that this is not the case? <coughs> What do each of these proofs have? Critics. Still, many people find them fascinating. And so some Christians use such ideas to try to prove that trust in God, <clears throat> that trust in God is smart. These Christians trust that such proofs are bullets in the war against atheism. Plus, they say, such ideas help in sharing the good news. The proofs remove the doubts that stop some people from coming to faith. What should we do with these proofs? Are such proofs helpful? Yes and no. They can help us to speak to today's skeptics. But few people can be argued into the kingdom. Still, what do the proofs help us to remember? We have a role to play in sharing and fighting for the faith. <clears throat> Just like Christians in every other age had. As Christians, we know that we must agree that God is real. Only then can we truly grasp the universe and ourselves as humans. John Calvin in the Institutes of the Christian Religion said this to gain a clear knowledge of yourself. First look at God's face, then go down from thinking about him to looking at yourself. Thank you for listening. Please excuse my voice and please comment, like, and subscribe. Thank you.